We live in the wine country of Northern California, about 80 miles north-northwest of San Francisco. And our homes and amateur stations are on an almost exactly east-west path, about five miles apart. And although it may not look like it from this photo, on almost every amateur band, we have a problem when it comes to radio communications. The radio paths drawn in on the exaggerated terrain profile map at the bottom identify our problem. Radio communications on the direct path between us is completely blocked by a low hill you see at the center of the map, just to the east of John's location. Not only is there a hill, but it's covered with trees and foliage, which are effective absorbers. To make matters worse, John's location is in the shadow of 100 plus foot tall eucalyptus trees. The fuzzy reflection paths from mountains to the west are actually how we communicate on VHF and UHF bands. Even though we're not far apart, uh, signals are fairly weak on all amateur bands, though. One morning as we were sitting having coffee together, looking at our paper coffee cups, we had an idea on how to fix the problem. Instead of trying to add bigger antennas or more transmitter power, as is usually done to fix a problem like this, how about if we put an antenna where the signal is? way high above John's location. How about if we made a very lightweight antenna and suspended it with a balloon several hundred feet in the air? From previous work, I already knew how to make a very low loss transmission line out of a single conductor. This is called a surface wave transmission line. Couldn't we use that to both tether the balloon and to feed an antenna located at the top? After some thought and several iterations, this is the antenna we ended up with. It's an extended disc cone that can operate from 400 megahertz to 20 gigahertz. We made it from metallized paper of the same kind you can buy in an art supply store. The top disc has been extended into a cylinder and the whole thing weighs about one ounce. Because of its shape, we call it the Mercury capsule, after the American spacecraft of that name. The cone portion doubles as what's called a launcher that couples to and from the combination tether and surface wave transmission line, which is hooked to an amateur transceiver down on the ground below. At the ground end, there's another launcher, like the one shown here, upside down. It has a coaxial connection on one end and a connection to the tether or surface wave transmission line at the other. It's also made from the same kind of metallized paper we used for the mercury capsule antenna. Before we show you what actually happened, we'd like to show you what we thought we could expect. This plot shows an RF propagation model prediction of signal levels between stations at various distances. It shows what happens as the antenna of one of the stations goes from a low level, here seven feet, the line on the bottom in blue, to the 200 foot level, the top of the cluster of lines. At the very top is what would happen if those two stations had completely line of sight separation between their antennas. The left vertical axis is the received signal level in dBm, and the right axis is also the received level, but as displayed on the S meter, the signal strength meter of the particular ICOM 706 Mark II G transceivers we were using. What we'll be showing you first is what the signal sounded like between two ground mounted antennas. This strength is much less than that predicted by the model because of the intervening hill that is blocking signals between the two locations. In this photo you see one of the ground mounted antennas at about 12 feet above ground level. Identical antennas were used at each end. To let you hear it, we're going to be using a software defined radio to play back a recording made for of the conversation. You'll be seeing a display, which is highlighted in this photo, with 3 dB per horizontal division calibration. Next we'll show you what happened when we deployed the flying antenna. 
In this photo you can see the antenna in the center supported by three helium balloons and below it a special winder for the feed line tether as well as a safety tether that John had made for this experiment. This photo shows the winder with the bottom launcher and the radio used for the experiment. Here again are the winder and antenna on the west end of the path prior to being launched. In this next recording you'll hear what it sounded like with the flying antenna at a hundred feet above ground level. This is still considerably below the top of the obscuring hill between the two locations. In this next clip, John has left the tether out, unwound it, so that the flying antenna is at 150 feet above ground level. This is about 100 feet or so below the top of the hill. The MT-60s at B flying a single wire transmission line to an antenna at 150 feet above on a foggy morning on uh, 432.1 megahertz and uh, seems to be a little wind picking up. A little bit of south wind picking up. My transmission line is out of the trees still, but just fortunately there's a hole in the trees. In these final two clips, you're going to hear the result with the antenna at 250 feet above ground level. The first is single sideband, and the second there will be a carrier uh, so you can observe the signal strength. The N6GN K6TZB, you're 59 in Grayton, Charlie Mike 88, November Kilo. We're flying an antenna at almost exactly 250 feet right above my QTH. Uh, I, an antenna supported by a single wire transmission line uh, in 6 gn As you've seen and heard, there is easily more than 40 dB of signal improvement by using the flying antenna system. In addition, because both the antenna itself and the surface wave transmission line feed line are very broadband, the system is usable over all amateur VHF through microwave band. This combination offers the possibility of some high rate information services such as internet access and HDTV on uh, amateur bands. Uh, using existing ground located equipment, uh, the heavy stuff can stay on the ground. This might be useful for amateur radio public services and um, emergency sorts of operations. Although the surface wave technology shown here is patented, uh, fortunately for radio amateurs worldwide, uh, use of it by amateurs under the terms of their licenses for their own personal and non-commercial use is allowed.